Lisa Page uh, is near and dear to Penn Faulkner's heart. She is a longtime board member of Penn Faulkner and its former president. She is a writer herself. You may have heard her on public radio here in DC on the Diane Reem Show. And um, Lisa is currently the acting director of creative, creative writing at the George Washington University. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Page. Hear me okay now? Okay. Um, it's my pleasure to be here tonight with you all um, and to be in conversation with Molly McCloskey, who is the author of two short story collections, Solomon Seal and the Beautiful Changes, and a novel, uh, Protection. Her first work of nonfiction, Circles Around the Sun in Search of a Lost Brother, details um, her life around her schizophrenic brother. Molly is a regular contributor to the Irish Times and to the Dublin Review, and has taught writing in Ireland and the U.S. She is currently Jenny McKean Moore Fellow at George Washington University here in Washington. She has also worked in the field of international aid in the UN's Kenya-based Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs for Somalia. Please welcome Molly McCloskey. So Molly, um, one of the um, amazing things about this book is its personal nature. It's about your brother and about your family. And um, I'd like, if you would please, to talk about your decision to, to do this story about your brother. Um, is this, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, well, the book came about uh, basically when I, came into possession of uh, 40 years worth of family letters that my mother had kept. And my brother was diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia when I was nine, and uh, I had never really known him prior to his becoming ill because he'd been away at college and things. So his, his illness had been, there was a sort of absent presence in in the family because he was he was certainly still there but he was he was no longer the person that he had been um, and I had tried to write about him in various ways I had written short stories about him I had attempted to write a novel about him so so the story was clearly you know uh, on my mind and and I had more or less given up on writing about him um, when I came into possession of these letters, and suddenly I had this amazing archive of not only family detail but also period detail about life in the 50s and the 60s and and the 70s, and letters that my mother and grandmother had written to each other, uh, that just gave me. A, I had the source material, like which is every writer's dream, um, because they wrote letters about three times a week to each other, and so detailing my family life from the time my parents got married in, in 1948 um, through my brother's birth and his growing up, and because he was the firstborn, I mean every detail was recorded, and uh, and then through his illness as they kind of tried to understand what was happening and so you can see the movement from their own complete ignorance of the illness um, up through the point of resignation you know and, and tracking that that movement within within their own lives so but you also made the decision to ask him for permission yeah I asked him my brother doesn't read so it was never going to be uh, he was diagnosed in 73 so he's been ill since you know for over 40 years and so it was never going to be the case of his reading the manuscript and signing off. And um, But I got what consent I could and spoke to him about the book and asked if he minded if I read about him and um, spoke to everyone else in my family. I mean, it could be the only family memoir in history that didn't result in family breakdown. Um, and my family was, in fact, a huge. Uh, I couldn't have written it literally. Couldn't have written it without them, uh, because they they provided so much input into it. So, so they were all on board, and uh, yeah. Well, and so often the formula of the memoir is: here's a problem, we're confronted with the problem, and then the writer has an epiphany or some kind of way is able to 
solve that problem, and that's the resolution of the memoir, and that's not the story of your brother. There are no epiphanies in this book. Um, no, I, I, uh, yeah, I think particularly in America, we're sort of addicted to that triumph over adversity um, narrative, and you know, the truth is that many people don't triumph, and that sometimes things don't work out, and sometimes people don't get better, and and I feel very strongly that those stories should be told too, and that if they are told well, and you know, to take a, an unflinching look at someone else's suffering and to try to do justice to that in print, um, you know, honestly and respectfully is, I think is, is in a way can be an uplifting exercise, you know, for, for the writer and for the reader. Um, and to me is a much more interesting thing than the simple, somewhat reductive, simplistic triumph over adversity. And when I started the book, I said to my sister, um, I don't want to write an unrelentingly sad book, um, even though my brother didn't get better, uh, because that's not the way I see life. And, and, and those sorts of books are, are not that much fun to read either. So, so she said, well, you know that the, the redeeming thing about the story is our mother and the way that she managed, uh, you know, at one point she had my brother who was was still very ill. She had two adolescents she was raising. She had another son who had come home to live with us and was hitting bottom in the living room. Uh, uh, I mean, alcoholically hitting bottom. And, uh, and my father had left. And she was managing this with, um, you know, amazing aplomb and, and good humor and, so she was, you know, even around these tragic stories where people don't get better and, and um, there isn't the sort of standard kind of triumph. There are other stories about how people respond to that, to that tragedy that, that can be, they can be very uplifting and, and you know, inspirational. Well, and the way that you present her and your father is about, in terms of the 50s and the the sort of post-war glory time that Mike is born into. And he doesn't really show signs of illness right away at all. In fact, it comes much Well, later. he showed signs of illness at what is the, the standard time for people to manifest um, clinical symptoms of schizophrenia, which is, uh, for men, kind of late teens, early 20s. So he was fine until then. Um, and was in fact very successful and got an academic scholarship to Duke, played basketball there for a year, um, you know, had girlfriends and, and, you know, interestingly, I interviewed three of his ex-girlfriends for the book and they still had mementos and letters and things. So he had quite an impact on women, apparently. Um, but yeah, one of the things that always appealed to me or, or interested me about the story was that I saw his life as in some ways emblematic of the bigger picture of America. I mean, he was a, he was born in 1950. Um, my parents were sort of, you know, classic middle class, upwardly mobile, um, increasingly successful, uh, beautiful young couple. Uh, through the 50s, the 60s, my brother went to school in 68, which was of course a seminal year. Um, culturally and politically and you know all through the 60s my parents were going through those changes that everybody else was was going through and not knowing how to react to the way that their own children were changing and looking different and sounding different and taking drugs and so my brother was and then through the 70s was sorry this period of sort of disillusionment I think and and the recession and all of that and and that was the period at which my family fell apart was 73 to 75 um, so, so I always saw his life as in some way reflective of, of a larger picture. And you initially had decided not to um, include yourself in this narrative, right? Yes. I thought, this is my brother's story. It's not my story, and I'm not going to be in it. I'm just going to be a sort of invisible um, narrator. So I wrote the first draft. Um, while I was writing the first draft, I, 
I had gone to Paris for four months just to take a sublet. I thought uh, I had some free time. I thought it would be interesting to go to Paris. And, and um, in fact, it was very isolating and, and lonely, and it was a very unhappy time in Paris. But while I was there, um, I met a psychiatrist named Azad. And Azad and I met once or twice a week. He to practice his English and I to practice my French. Um, but on our first meeting, Azad and I discovered that his sister, that we both had a sibling with schizophrenia. And in fact, that was why Azad had become a, a psychiatrist. So we always ended up talking about this when we were together. And, um, and I was having a really hard time in Paris. I was very unhappy. I was having, and I was working with really dark material. Um, it was, I remember re being in the apartment and reading about, you know, LSD rebirthing experiences and looking at these <laughs> horrendous drawings that people had done while they were undergoing, uh, uh, rebirthing on acid. And it was just, uh, you know, I thought I can't write about, this. you know, I can't deal with this. I can't work on this right now. And I thought, well, why don't I just write about what it's like to be feeling quite unhappy myself and trying to um, trying to work on this material. And then I ended up writing about Azad and our conversations. And um, so that became a chapter. And that was the only chapter in the first draft that I was actually in as a, as a kind of central character. And, and I gave the draft to two people and they both said, you know, you really have to do more of that because it's just too disembodied. The narrative is too disembodied. And at that point, it kind of freed me to um, to do that, to bring myself in. And at that point, it became a dual narrative. And we were just talking before about, you know, with nonfiction, you can be porous like that, I think, because you've got a story. You've always got a story to go back to, which is the thing that happened, you know. And if you get too far off the track, you can always go back to that thing that happened. Whereas with fiction, you kind of have to protect the space of the imaginative space of the story because nobody else is, is going to protect it for you so um so to be able to allow him in uh, that uh this this relationship this friendship that i had with this with this person in paris and what we had in common and um to be able to to allow that in it kind of changed the book in a way and it taught me an important lesson as well about nonfiction that you you need to have a structure, but you can always, you know, you have the freedom to deviate. On that note, would you read? Uh, sure. Right. What I'm going to read actually has nothing to do with anything that we've just <laughs> been talking about. I, we had it all set up where it would lead in, but it, I don't know what happened. Um, so, one of the things that I wrote about when I decided to bring myself into the into the narrative, uh, my rule of thumb was that I would only write about those parts of my life that in some way uh, seemed linked to me, to my brother's life, and those periods where I had some sort of insight into, I mean, you know, I'm talking very little insight, into some things that he might have been feeling. And um, so one of those, one of the things that, that was a catalyst for those those periods of insight was some very heavy drinking <clears throat> that took place in the west of Ireland where I was living. So I'm going to read a couple of uh, very short sections about that. Um, and I think some people in here, I know there's some Irish people in here who've probably been to these pubs and, <laughs> and got out alive. Actually, I have There were two pubs on our peninsula, about a mile apart, both peopled mostly by restless young men who farmed cattle or fished, and old men, drunk, delusional, mostly kind, who were prone to random oracular outbursts. The atmosphere in both places tended to veer between a mute despondency and a desperate bonhomie, like bar rooms out of Eugene O'Neill. Ellen's, the more respectable of the two, was a cold and darkish place which on a good night could overcome its desolation and blossom into something riotous and life-affirming, and to which people from Sligo Town, 12 miles away, sometimes ventured for a bit of rural rough. 
It was run by a couple in their 50s who were as plain and peaceable in their way as Jordan, the proprietor of the other pub, was garish and profane in his. Jordan had once staged a short season of female mud wrestling in the lounge area of his establishment. Now he contented himself with the occasional after-hours porn video on the box. In small doses, he was irresistible. Middle-aged, but with a head of dark, licentious ringlets, he was like a wild-eyed Pan or Caravaggio's sick Bacchus gone florid-faced and fat. No one from town ever came to Jordan's. The night I left my car by the side of the road, Leland and I went to Jordan's. We stayed till closing time, by which point I was begging her, don't leave me alone. She took me to her house and put me to bed on her sofa. And the next afternoon, we returned to Jordan's and stayed again through the evening. And again, she took me home to her sofa. At some point in the midst of those days, there was a storm. Ice coated the fields and the trees and the laneways. Even walking was treacherous. We were trapped on our glistening peninsula, a landscape lifted from fairy tale that under other circumstances might have thrilled me, but which now intensified my claustrophobia. There was nothing to do but ricochet between the two pubs, the poles of my narrowing existence. One day, we cracked open the slow gin. We had made it ourselves. In October, we had tramped gaily up the mountain, filling our wicker baskets with the beautiful cobalt blue berries the excursion taking on a deceptively healthy feel. Then we plopped the berries into gin and watched over the weeks, the liquid turn an unearthly neon violet like some nectar of the gods. When we drank it that icy Christmas, it reduced us all to tears. So, so that's a picture of the pub life. <laughs> Female mud wrestling is actually very common in Ireland in pubs, a little known fact. Yeah. But I also like that passage because it's about your life in Ireland and it's in sharp contrast to the life that you have with Mike. And yet it has a parallel with Mike's life. Uh, Mike uh, has a period with heavy drug use and LSD and for a while his schizophrenia isn't diagnosed. And you had this period, um, which... Uh, yeah, I think one of the, another interesting thing and, and complicating factor with his with the development of his illness was that it hit at a period not only when there was a lot of heavy drug use going on with hallucinogenics but also it was a time when the whole the nature of psychiatry and the nature of mental illness and the label mental illness was being questioned and so he was you know in the in the early 70s um when books like the myth of mental illness were coming out and so I think he himself wouldn't have necessarily known what, you know, he studied psychiatry as well. He was a, he was a psychology major, and, or a, he studied psychology. Um, so I think that complicated maybe what he thought was going on for himself, but what you're referring to, and there's a discussion in the book about um, the effects of very heavy drinking on, on the brain and on neurotransmitters, and I think... What was happening with me was, from what I have read about what's called the prodromal stage of schizophrenia, I think there's a lot of parallels between that and what happens with, with very heavy drinking where you're not actively hallucinating, but your perceptual, you know, your perceptions have, have gone kind of wonky, for, for lack of a more uh, technical term. Um, so, and I think like many, many siblings, uh, of, of people with schizophrenia, you know, I had a great fear growing up, as did my other siblings, which I only learned when I started researching the book and, and actually talking to them about, about Mike and their feelings about it, was that we all grew up with this fear that, well, that came out of nowhere and, and hit him, and so why shouldn't it come out of nowhere and hit me? And so this period that we're talking about here, which was, um, you know, the end of my uh, drinking was, um, you know that fear was there because there were there were similarities and there were there were parallels and um, so is that does that make yeah. sense does it? Um, I thought it was very brave of you um, to also talk about your other brother Steve about his problems and also tied to alcohol in some ways as well and bottoming out and his if, if he was afraid of losing his mind I'm you know impressed that you've learned that in the process of writing the book. 
Yeah, I and mean, Steve was incredibly generous with this book. And he was the first, when I first got the idea, I spoke to my parents and I spoke to Steve because Steve was closest to Mike growing up. And, and he would have had the most emotional, st the biggest stake in it emotionally in this story. And he was immediately, uh, yes, I think you should do this. And it actually brought us much closer. Um, and he had me to his house. I'm the only one in the family who's actually ever stayed at his house. You know, he's he's a very eccentric sort of uh, character. But um, and he was and he helped me a lot to find people to find old friends of Mike's. Um, but he also allowed me to use a story from his life, which is when he hit bottom in our house. Um, and he was at one point, you know, living on the street, digging food out of a dumpster and. And now is is a lawyer and is writing a textbook for Prentice Hall and you know he's he's turned his life around. But I thought it was incredibly generous of him to to allow me to tell what was you know it presents him in a um, you know in a very difficult light. And um, I was the one who dropped him at the Seven Eleven when my mother finally kicked him out of the house um, for for almost starting a fire in the middle of the night and. And, you know, inadvertently, you know, he didn't try to set a fire. I think he was cooking or something. You know, one of those things you do when you're drunk at 4 a.m. You decide to cook something and then you fall asleep. And and uh, so I took him to the 7-Eleven and, and left him there. And, you know, five days later he came home sober. And, and that was 1982. So, you know, it's he, he was... He was really generous and he's a big part of the book. And he, he also, when I told him about it, I think he felt very much, it was almost as though he needed the story to be told as well, to kind of complete the picture. Because I often think that when I'm, any city I've ever lived in, and even now in Foggy Bottom, there's a man I see every day um, who reminds me of my brother. And and you see people and they're, they're, they're ill. And you know that at one time there was another there was somebody else there before they became ill. And and I always felt that way about my brother, about putting the whole picture back together again. Um, and I think Steve felt that as well, the need to do that or the, you know, once I kind of named it as a possibility, he was very, he was great about it. That's, uh, you also make mental illness in very clear in terms of how sometimes there's lucidity, sometimes there's even brilliant, you talk about how your mother never gives up on him, never gives up on Mike. She's always got this positive um, uh, attitude about him because she gets these moments of clarity. Yeah, I think uh, in the first few years of this illness, that that's the nature of it, is psychotic breaks um, interspersed with lucidity. And so when the lucidity comes, and somebody is the, the hallucinations and and whatnot are are controlled by antipsychotics, and so you think, okay, well that's past now, and um, so Mike would be very lucid and and intelligent, and he would get himself a job, and then the whole thing would fall apart all over again. So it's very cruel, I think, in in that way as well as in in many other ways. And so my mother was, you know, constantly on that kind of treadmill or. or, or you know that revolving door of of hoping and then not wanting to hope too much and and then eventually there's a sort of plateauing that goes on. The other thing that you do with your mother that I found interesting, you've got parallels with your siblings and then you've got a parallel with your marriage breaking up and you write about her marriage breaking up. Um, you play with chronology a lot in this in this book and I wondered how you made that choice. It's not a straight line for you. You go back and forth. Yeah, I know it sounds like nothing happy happens in this book, <laughs> but it does have its moments. Um, yeah, well, we were, we talk about this a lot in in the nonfiction classes I teach. Is you know the great thing about nonfiction is that you don't have to make anything up. You know, the story is there. The very difficult thing about nonfiction is ordering events and structuring, uh, because you can really do anything um, structurally and in terms of linear, nonlinear. Um, so what I did was I had a linear story about my brother, which was coming from the time of his birth or actually the time my parents met and then leading up to his birth. And then, um, and I kept that very linear 
but then kind of interspersed along that along that spine were were these sort of things that came in uh, in a non-linear way that had to do more with the present and and with myself and with my other members of the family. Okay. Would you read the, your second section for? Uh, Okay, um, we're still on the same pub, uh, basically. <laughs> Some months later. Um, several, ma several months after... Uh, sorry. I knew there's something wrong when I can't see. Um, several months after that harrowing Christmas, the terrors of the holiday season receded, and in their place settled exhaustion and a droning despondency. There was also a strange feeling of homesickness, as though there was somewhere else I should be or could be. I felt I had lost something I was almost certain I had once possessed, something like the capacity for wonder. I could recall being 17 and feeling free of fear and capable of uncomplicated happiness. At the same time, I often wondered if everyone wasn't, in fact, feeling more or less as I was. Maybe this gray stasis was just the way life was when you grew up and nobody talked about it, the way nobody talked about death or menopause or the pain of childbirth. Maybe it was just one of the great unspoken truths of adulthood and grousing about it would be an embarrassing breach of etiquette. In the varieties of religious experience, William James credits alcohol with stimulating in us those yearnings usually crushed to earth by the cold facts and dry criticisms of the sober hour. James's notion that drunkenness makes us momentarily one with truth and his simple, oft-quoted statement of fact, sobriety diminishes, discriminates, and says no, drunkenness expands, unites, and says yes, is framed by an acknowledgement that we are not designed to bear unlimited expansion. It is part of the deeper mystery and tragedy of life, he writes, that whiffs and gleams of something that we immediately recognize as excellent should be vouchsafed to so many of us, only in the fleeting earlier phases of what in its totality is so degrading a poison. If James had known what we know now of neurotransmitters, he undoubtedly would have applied this knowledge to his analysis of the human condition. But he viewed the drunken consciousness as part of the larger mystic consciousness, and it is likely he would have continued to recognize alcoholism for what it also is, a manifestation of the yearning for more, a misguided attempt to fill the void. For if the persistence of craving reveals anything, it is the sense of incompleteness at the heart of us. That August, in what was to be my last proper binge, a group of us traipsed about together for two days and nights, and the exquisite release that one is always seeking but hardly ever finding, those moments when just the right note is hit, and the fear and the cynicism and the knowing how it all turns out or simply forgotten, was given to me like a parting gift one final time. Dermot's publisher was over from London, along with the publisher's wife and his wife's brother. They'd rented a little cottage on the peninsula. Leland was there, and Dermot's wife, and two painter friends of ours from Belfast, an Australian and, a, and an Australian painter named Marcus, who lived in Berlin. One day, full of woozy cheer, we zoomed through the countryside, the English being far more sober, the designated drivers, singing along with Hank Williams' cassettes and hearing the literary gossip from London. The sea was everywhere. We played pool at Ernie's in Kearney, and we bought a salmon in Ross's Point. That night we cooked a proper meal, or the English did, for Dermot always insisted on eating properly when we were on the Raz. The days were gloriously sunny, and everybody fell waywardly in love with everybody else, and there were kisses around corners and proclamations of feeling, and there were tears and the gnashing of teeth. In the fields around us, the cattle lowed in all their oblivious and beastly majesty. On the kitchen table in the little cottage was a bowl of grapes, and I told Marcus that I had always wanted to be fed purple grapes while drinking wine from a pewter chalice, a, fa a fantasy of classical antiquity, and he complied. I put my head on his lap, and he held above me a cluster of fat purple grapes, and I took them one by one into my mouth. With the early evening sun streaming in the window and all the food and drink and friends I would ever need, I wanted the world to stop right there. If we could just keep colluding in the dream, I thought, it would never have to end. But the English went home and the Australian went back to Berlin and we were left with ourselves and only our usual pool of unimpressive excuses. Everything crashed in the way it always did and all the ghouls lined up for their pound of flesh and the loneliness was as sterile and cold as steel. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm. The, right after that gets better. <laughs> <laughs> Would you talk a little more about your mother too and how she was sort of this shining light um, from the start actually um, in terms of her personality but also her life. Uh, you've touched a little bit on this book and America and the 50s and she's sort of this golden girl and and how her narrative plays throughout. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she was, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, she, she was kind of a classic kind of 1950s beauty. She was on the cover of the Ladies Home Journal in uh, 54, I think. Um, my family was featured as this, um, what was it called? How Young America Lives, with this uh, series, you know. And, um, and she was, my father was a basketball coach and manager all his life. And so she was um, a cheerleader and a mother of six. And, and you know, that whole sort of pre-Betty Friedan um, housewife support. Uh, and which was all fine until the early 70s when my father lost his job and couldn't get another job for a couple of years. And my mother went to work part-time at a newspaper. And... Uh, and then my father left, and she kind of, uh, by uh, by necessity, had to reinvent herself from this from this support role and to the breadwinner and a single mother, and um, did so in a way that was, you know, amazing. She actually ran for office. She ran for the state legislature in, in Oregon, and um, she just became. I, I don't know. I, I don't really. The transition was was really amazing because it was accompanied by no bitterness. Um, she's adamantly uh, opposed to self pity of any kind, and you know she just. So she she's. I'm she, I'm unashamed about the fact that she's she is the the hero of the book, um, and there are some really beautiful. A lot of the letters were between herself and Mike, and. It's a kind of almost a love story that's running through the book, and and Mike, I think, like many people who suffer from schizophrenia, there's a kind of flat affect that, um, where where no emotion is really perceivable from the outside. And I read these letters between them, and where he expresses quite a lot of of emotion and love, and talks about missing her and how he can't wait to see her again. And you know, this is when he's an adult, and. Um, so there was a kind of a of an unspoken depth, I think, to the to the relationship that I wasn't aware of, and I certainly wasn't aware of of I think the strength of my mother's character until I really got into the book and started started really researching it and and seeing on a day to day basis what she was dealing with because certainly as an adolescent you kind of tune a lot of things out. So um, so yeah, she's she's um, she's the hero of the book. The other thing that really struck me was your use of setting. You're in so many places in this book, from Kosovo to Dublin to Paris, Oregon, North Carolina, um, and yet you managed to pull the thread of yourself, your family, through all of these places, and the places come alive, as you heard with the pubs, but it's also <laughs> Paris, it's, it's Kosovo, it's um, North Carolina. Mm. Um, yeah, well, that's a good editor. You know, I when I first gave <laughs> when I first gave the book to my editor, whom I've known since I think two thousand, and so we know each other quite well. And he said, you know, I've known you, I've know a lot of these stories, I know you, but I my head is spinning, and we need to. You know, he really liked the nonlinear aspect of it, but he said, you know, if my head is spinning, you know, what is somebody who doesn't know you going to? So we he. We just worked with it and, and eliminated a lot of sort of dead ends that really didn't need to be in there about different places and kind of streamlined it, um, the geography. And so it still has that thing of that uh, thing of going all over the place, but hopefully not in a, in a confusing way. Well, you bring it back to Mike, and, and where is Mike now? What is happening with Mike now? Uh, he's in um, Oregon. Um, and the book ends with um, where he has decided that he doesn't want to speak to anyone in my family anymore, um, and which is really interesting. And I look a lot in the book about at, at 
at the question of choice with with someone who has a mental illness and and how do we read choice and it seemed uh, the question of if you if you think that somebody is exercising a lot of choice are you are you blaming them for for the way their life is if you if you think they're they, they don't have any choices are you kind of taking away their autonomy and and it's and these aren't questions I was able to answer, but I, I I tried to explore them. And and at the end of the book, he says that he doesn't want to see any of us ever again. And I think that there's there were reasons for that, um, that have to do with our presence, um, not necessarily providing what we thought it was and and him finally feeling like he had the right to to say that but in fact what happened since was he moved to a different uh location uh into a foster family and he re-established contact with us he re-established contact with my mother and the last time i saw him when i was in oregon and he was more conversant uh in a better humor he was cracking jokes so he was better than any of us had seen him in a long time. And, you know, it's very relative, kind of better. But, um, but so it's a happier note than the book ends on. So it's ongoing. I mean, that's what's so interesting to me about this story is that it doesn't finish and that you don't feel compelled to give us the final conclusion. Yeah, it is ongoing. Everybody's still alive. Yeah. We'd like to open this up for questions if... Any of you have any? I had a question uh, about the culture of the social family side and the integration of that and, and what we do in Colombia of course and in the US The title actually comes from a letter of Mike's a very uh, one of the very disjointed kind of delusional letters, but also a beautiful letter. Um, and again, this is a good editor picking that out for a title. That we struggled to find the title, so that that's where that comes from. Other questions? Mm-hmm. He had a number of hospitalizations, um, but once he was in subsidized housing, he was never without a bed again, and it was residential. Um, some of those places I, I would have visited, not all, because I would then move to, to Ireland. But, um, yeah, he, he was never homeless as a result of not of there not being a bed for him. And his medication was always uh, paid for um, from disability. So in terms of the level of care he got from uh, psychiatrists and whatnot, I couldn't really say because I was a teenager at, at that time. And um, I know that people who are dealing with this now, and mostly I'm, I know in Ireland, I don't, you know, because I haven't been living here, but, you know, it's there's a frustration with taking people in and, and they're given medication and nobody really has time to engage with them in an ongoing way in a in a more kind of uh, psychiatric setting. Was he uh, socialized? Yeah, yeah. Did he recognize when you say he used to... He takes his medication, but then he would say things like, um, I can't leave Oregon because of my job with the mental health services, which is clearly not true um so it's difficult to say what um the level of awareness is and what he believes of what he's saying and um i think from what i've been told awareness can still be quite low even after decades and even when all the evidence is there um so i i don't know actually what but he does take his medication um, so 
Yeah, certainly in the early in the early years, there was a lot of going off medication. Yeah. Um, an issue in terms of deciding how much verbatim uh, you mean structurally or ethically or just, just, yeah, just in terms of what you wanted to do in the book yeah I mean I generally think quoting big blocks of text from another source is not a, is not a very good idea narratively um, so a lot of it I just used for background material so I actually reconstructed scenes and on the basis of letters you know that they were sitting down and she was making him a you know peanut brittle ice cream ring and you know, whatever they ate in 1950 um, so, so I incorporated it a lot there were uh, there were very few letters that were quoted in in their entirety and and when they were they were there was something very special about them yes the bit Are you suggesting my family had problems? <laughs> um, we actually get together voluntarily every summer, all of us. And I didn't realize that was strange until somebody told me that. And, um, when I finished, I think, the whatever draft it was before it went off to, uh, to the publisher, I sent the draft to my siblings and I said if anybody wants to add anything, if anybody feels I've said anything that's not true, uh, please tell me. And there was a couple of things, uh, but very minor. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things that I found out was, which is exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, was there's a period in the book which I paint as like the... the the end of I, I see as kind of the paradise years of my family after which um, we were expelled from our paradise and everything fell apart which was the year I was eight and I subsequently found out that for other members of the family this was a very bad time you know my parents were trying to kickstart their marriage and um, after you know a very bad time uh, a couple of my siblings were very unhappy um, so it's but nobody, nobody questioned my version, um, interestingly enough, um, because they could have said, no, that, that year was not a good year, and, and they, they didn't, so. Yes, in the back. Well, we're six children, and of the six, three are, are alcoholics. So it's um, we're kind of used to that part of the <laughs> maybe. Um, I mean, I don't mean that f flippantly, but I think alcoholism often has a, a much better outcome. My experience of the outcome, watching the outcome of schizophrenia is, you know, it, it hasn't been good. Whereas in my family, you know, everybody who had the other condition, you know, sorted themselves out. And so I think it can have a much happier ending. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better answer than that, but. 
really have much of a memory of that. I know that we went to family counseling once, which I have a very vague memory of. Um, but you know that was the seventies, and it wasn't like now when when you know you'd probably be given age appropriate books explaining to you what schizophrenia was, and um, it just I think children were much more left alone then, and and I suppose you could say left in the dark. But I I think we also didn't really want to know, and um, and my parents dealt with it very differently. You know, I think my father took it. He took it personally this is a this is a shame on our family and things like that and um and there was probably more blame attached whereas my my mother was you know I mean we've talked about that so she was very different and um so I think as a child I you know just blocking it out and not being involved. I think the great challenge for my mother was that she had two adolescents, 11 and 13, to, when my father left to raise, and then she had this other son who she didn't want to exclude and wanted him to feel very much a part of the family, and how did she do that without, while protecting us, the younger ones? And it was, I think, a quite a difficult balancing act. One more question? Yes. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I think yeah, I think the fiction. You know, I'm not that interested in making things up, and so um, I think discovering nonfiction and and discovering how much I liked it was really a pleasure and trying to figure out how to incorporate elements of um, say the personal essay or the memoir into a novel is something that I'm really interested in and I'm very interested in novels that do that and so in that so I think that's the that's the change is like how can I take this voice this tone these tools and use it in in fiction which feels more immediate and true than a lot of than a lot of fiction. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. <laughs> <laughs>